guests uh, come and share and learn some insights about this uh, potentially very valuable topic. Um, however, before we begin, um, we wanted to ask you, the audience out there, if you would do us a little favour and, and just make use of the chat box. If you could just pop in the chat box, uh, let us know where you're from in the world um, and also let us know what you do. And if you don't mind sharing the information, just let us know uh, what company you work for. So, so that's let us know where you're from in the world and let us know what you do. Um, if you happen to be a student or anything like that, just let us know um, uh, what you're studying and where you're studying. So, yeah, let us know a little bit about yourself. Let us know where you're from and let us know what you do. Uh, that will also allow our panellists to just have an idea of uh, who they're talking to. A um, little bit about today's sponsor. So today, the sponsor is uh, Fetchify. Um, and Fetchify provide address lookup and validation services together with plugins for all size and sorts of e-commerce businesses. Now, they are today's sponsor. So they would be, if you are in the market for such services, I'm sure they'd be delighted to hear from you. Their contact details are up on the screen now and uh, we'll probably share them as well later in the session. Uh, just a few house rules though before we begin. If you do have any questions or comments then um, please use the chat box to pop them in there. Um, if uh, you have a question or comment that's somewhat convoluted or long-winded, you can also uh, click on the raise your hand feature and that will allow us to sort of like request your audio. So you could actually speak to us uh, live, if you like, as a real human. Um, so you've got two options there. You can either leave your questions or comments in the chat box. You can speak to us live, but you have to click on the raise hand feature and give, a little, give us a little blue hand and we'll be able to request your audio. So basically, that's your options. Um, we do want to try and keep this session as interactive as possible. We've got some great experts on the panel today, so feel free to get involved. <clears throat> if you happen to be watching this on our YouTube channel, um, unfortunately, that isn't being uh, monitored at the moment, so you won't be able to interact with us, uh, I'm afraid, there. If you do want to interact with us, you'll either have to go onto our Eventbrite page, register, or I'm told you can actually access the webinar while it's live via our LinkedIn page. So there's your options. Anyway, um, for those that are new to the sessions, uh, my name is Dale Hicks and I am the uh, co-founder and director of the Fashion Network. I will be today's chair. Uh, joining me, though, on the panel, we have a panel of three very uh, experienced experts. Uh, firstly, we have Russell Jones. Now, Russell is the CEO of Fetchify, who's obviously our partner. Um, but Russell has a, a particular expertise in this field and has worked with various different clients, uh, such as Moonpig, French Connection and Pangea. Uh, I have to say, uh, Russell, I'm quite familiar with Moonpig. I have been this week anyway. <laughs> uh, good, good. Uh, alongside uh, Russell, we have, uh, no, brace myself here now, Dr. Demetrius Sivrikos. I hope that's okay, Demetrius. Uh, and Demetrius is a consumer and business psychologist at the University College London. And alongside him is Paul Rogers, and Paul is the Managing Director of Vivant. Uh, Paul has over 12 years experience in large e-commerce technology and consumer experience projects. Uh, and his, his work has included working for such companies such as Heels, The Conran Shop and Muji. Uh, another brand I've had a uh, recent experience with. Um, but before we delve into the uh, session, we have a poll that we're going to bring up. So um, my colleague Scarlett in the background will publish a poll. There you go. Um, and the question is, do you measure each stage of the checkout journey? So your answers are no, we don't measure checkout conversion. No, we only measure checkout conversion as a whole. Or yes, we measure each stage. So yes, I'll let you fill that in while you're doing that i'll just have a quick look at who's in the audience i'll give you a quick shout out so hello Gillian, um who's pets at home from swindon um amy cooper hello newcastle black and decker good to see you guys um hi caroline um who else have we got here um anthony uh e-commerce specialist halls and curtis good to see you um tracy from london uh Hi, Margaret. Great. So the poll is being filled out um, and hopefully in a few minutes we should uh, see the answer of the poll. So here we go. So there we go. Uh, and it's 50% of our audience saying no, we only measure the checkout conversion as a whole. 
so I'm going to come to you quickly, Russell. Does that come as a surprise to you or, or as it is unexpected? Uh, yeah, it's actually, um, I think, a, a higher proportion than I would have expected. I mean, perhaps, um, you know, at attendees, um, uh, you know, are, 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 are sort of... Um, more uh, attuned to uh, you know to check out conversion because you know because they're obviously chosen to come along so that may have skewed the numbers a little bit we we see that um, amongst our customers that, that we deal with at Fetchify about half of them measure checkout conversion and and half of them don't and and of of the half that do you know very few few of them actually measure the, the, the each and every stage so so it's a little bit higher but I, I think given the you know, given um, that people have a, a vested interest in a sense because they come on the um, on the on the uh, the webinar, perhaps that, that's not surprising. But it's it's good it's good to see the, those those figures. Okay, cool. So my first question then to Russell and is sort of want to start from the beginning here. And it, forgive me, uh, audience, if it's a bit of a basic question, but um, I just want to start by asking why should you be measuring your basket abandonment and conversion rate? Can you sort of just set the scene, Russell, uh, in that respect? Absolutely, Dale. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, welcome everybody. Um, so, uh, so why should you measure um, uh, basket abandonment rate and, and, and check out conversion? Well, it's, it it, uh, it used to be uh, the million dollar question. It, I suppose it's actually the trillion dollar question, um, really, um, because it, um, in the UK alone, um, we see. I saw a study recently that showed about about eighteen billion uh, pounds worth of um, sales. Um, are lost um, to e-commerce stores in the UK uh, every year um, due to um, a basket abandonment, and, um, and and that's just in the UK. Um, you know, if you were to, to look at the US market or worldwide, as I say, I think I think I saw an estimate um, that e-commerce sales in the US next year were going to be about one trillion dollars. Um, so if your abandonment rate is something like seventy percent, then you're really losing sort of two trillion dollars a year. Um, in the, in the US um, on basket brand, so it really is the the big question. Um, clothing retail actually has um, one of the highest levels of of basket abandonment, um, um, and there are some segments even within clothing retail I understand which are are higher still. Um, of course, it's worse during peak um, with people doing a lot of shopping maybe for. Um, for putting together Christmas lists or looking um, at different Black Friday offers and putting things in their basket. And, and so it is worse during peak. Um, so it's particularly kind of relevant at this time of year. Um, and what's critical is after um, consumers have abandoned their baskets, um, less, less than a third of them actually come back to buy. So less than a third come back to buy um, and about 25% who abandon a basket go on to buy from a competitor so that's really you know it's it's really key if you if you if you if we can get consumers over the line and and through the checkout successfully um obviously it's good for our sales but it but it um also avoids uh, them them going to a competitor so that's that's really key um yeah so 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 th those are those are the key reasons uh, dale thank you it's interesting you're saying the clothing's uh, higher than a lot of other sectors I um, have to say in my experience of real retail it's pretty much the same <laughs> you get a load of uh, you think you're going to do a big sale and then obviously you, you, you know a lot of the clothes just get put back on the rail so it kind of mirrors real retail um, Paul I'm going to come to you next and so we've talked about the sort of why can you talk us about how uh, do you measure uh, basket abandonment yeah, absolutely. yeah, and I um I would caveat that I'm I'm not like a kind of typical CRO person that might comment on some of this stuff, but I can definitely talk around like what our clients typically do and kind of how the tools they use and kind of how they're reporting on this stuff. Um, so Google Analytics is where most people start. So you've got kind of the standard enhanced ecom checkout abandonment report where you can see kind of how people are progressing through the checkout. Um, that's usually like the top line number people would use in terms of um, abandonment rate, which might make it onto their trade report. And then occasionally people would look at um, kind of how that's changing over time across the different steps. Um, some of our clients use events in GA as well to analyze specific um, things within the checkout, such as like engagement with payment methods um, or shipping methods, et cetera. Um, and then from there, some a couple of our clients have created bespoke scripts to monitor kind of how people are interacting with forms. And there's kind of various um, third parties out there that can support that as well, like um, kind of form analysis tools 
dependent on the econ platform you're using and how much control you have um, over the checkout. Um, and then you have things like Hotjar, Crazy Egg for like session recording, um, heat map and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then I would say the, ne the next one that a lot of our clients are now either moving to or have started using is Content Square. Um, which gives you a lot more detail around customer journeys generally um, and kind of gives you a lot more um, data and which you can then use to kind of test different things and that applies to the checkout as well. Um, and then one tool that I wanted to mention because I think it's, it can be really valuable is Noibu. Um, so basically that is, it has some level of kind of like um, checkout kind of monitoring, but the, the main kind of feat, or the, what it really does is um, uh, bug identification and then it helps you to prioritize based on likely commercial um, loss I guess um, but we've had a few clients use that um, and I think that's a really valuable um, addition um, to check for around checkout dependent on which technology stack you have um, and then one other comment I was going to say was um, looking at your acceptance rates or rejection rates with your payment gateway as well can be a really good it's not necessarily related to abandonment rates typically that metric um, but it's a really good thing to monitor. Um, and um, Russell, I'm going to bring you back in here now. Actually, so I'd like if you if you can just talk us through about each stage of the checkout journey that you should be monitoring. If you can just talk us through that a little bit, uh, that would be great. Okay, no, uh, ha happy to. Yeah. Um, so, um, so I, I think you know it's it's important, obviously, sort of. To, to look at why people are uh, abandoning their baskets and, and not completing checkouts. And, and, you know, and the three, the three most common reasons um, is that the, the, the extra costs are too high. So for example, delivery costs uh, or shipping costs um, or tax or, or other fees are too high. Um, the second biggest one is that the site asked me to create an account. Um, and the third biggest one is, is that it's just too long or, or too complicated a process. Um, so it could very well be that that shipping is, you know, the shipping stage. Um, if you think about the kind of typical kind of three stage checkout where you put in your, you know, your sort of contact information, you choose your delivery options and then you put in your payment. Those are the, the classic kind of three steps. It's important not to assume that uh, shipping is the, you know, is, is the main. It's important to kind of understand, you know, um, you know, stage by stage, um, you know, at which point you're seeing the biggest dropouts um, or the biggest compared to um, benchmarks. Um, and, and, and even within there, as Paul said, there are some tools that are available where you can look even within the, the page at, uh, at where are people getting halfway through the, the form filling and then not completing all, all of the form. There are tools that, that you can utilize to, to actually sort of see it exactly at what point, even within the page, they, they are dropping out. And it's just, it's just um, you know, and, and of course it is, it's the law of, in, you know, of, of marginal gains, you know, really small improvements that, um, you know, we would always recommend you A-B test for something as important as a checkout. Um, really small improvements can, ha can have a massive difference. And of course, cumulatively, um, they can make a huge difference um, to the business. But yeah, the key point of, of, of why measure at each stage is, is that, you know, is that it, you know, we shouldn't assume um, that, uh, that they're dropping out um, at a particular point. We, we really need to understand that and, and, and quantify that um, against, um, against a benchmark or using an A-B test um, to do that. It's interesting because um, obviously we're, um, it's in peak time now and we're getting up to Christmas and got a bit of anecdotal information here actually because I've been um obviously been really busy today with other work but I've been doing a little bit of Christmas shopping in between it should we say and, and I've abandoned a few things today and it's been for me it was actually just to do the fact that like the return the sorry the delivery details wasn't there at the checkout stage so I didn't want to commit to actually you know you know check out until I knew that am I going to get this before Christmas or not, you know, and that was because that information wasn't there at that stage, obviously in things like Amazon, there's it's convenience and factor of that is, is, is good and you know exactly what you're in for. But there was a couple of sort of independent retailers that were shopping on, I was like, oh, I'm not sure if I'm going to get this, you know, by Christmas or not, you know. It's a good, no, it's a good observation. And, and I think my observation of, 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 of online shopping this peak season, say compared to last peak season, is that I think there are a lot more, you know, independent retailers who are getting much better at putting delivery information and returns information, you know, really upfront 
um, you know, not on the product page, but actually at the first stage of, of, of the checkout. That's a, that's a lot more, I was in, a, you know, my, my experience at this peak is, is there's, that, that's a lot more common, which I think is a huge step forward. Um, and I'm sure will make a big difference to, um, mm-hmm. to you know, to checkout conversion. Um, it can be so frustrating sometimes, you know, because obviously convenience drives the customer journeys, you know, not just within fashion, but across a lot of fast moving consumable goods. But, you know, I do like to spread the love, if you like, and sort of shop with independent retailers. It's like it's the, it's the convenience factor that's, Absolutely. you know, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a tricky one to, 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 you know, you end up going back to the same retailers. Um, uh, Demetrius, I'm going to bring you in here, actually. So obviously we've talked about sort of different um stages where people will abandon uh, the, the purchasing point but really good to know from a, from a psychological point of view what those pain points are can you sort of elaborate a little bit on that and why i mean obviously you've had my personal example of why i've abandoned my cards today but is there any sort of research or any, anything from your perspective that you can add to this and oh, no, absolutely i'd start with thank you so much for the invitation um, this is um, a really, really great topic. And I think one of the first key things that I think retailers or anyone who works in the area need to, to look into is, you know, how smooth is that transition? And psychologically speaking, people actually avoiding uncertain situations. To give you an example, I think, you know, retailers, online retailers at the moment, they're creating the most smooth, beautiful experience when it comes to choosing your product, understanding the information, and then adding it, adding it to, to your basket. Then it's almost all of a sudden, you know, so, you know, the transition of smoothness and high aesthetics and ease of actually using that drops. And then it's almost like physically speaking, um, a sales assistant takes you back at the back room in the storage cupboard with a, with a sort of an ATM and asking you, now you have to pay us and ask you all this really private information about who you are, where do you live? And I'm going to gauge about who you might be, how much I'm going to cost, you know, you know, how the product is going to cost you. So the, the level of uncertainty in between smooth and then at the back of it, you know, it's just quite raw, quite rough. At times, you know, design-wise, it's actually quite poor. It is one of the put-off points because people go, oh, hold on a second. What's this? Is this a part of the site? At times, you know, the colors change, the smooth change, the music changes or stops, and it becomes really serious, very strict. And then consumers already feel that this is not the same thing. This is something different. The second component is, I think, is being alluded is transparency. It's not transparent versus, you know, you ask a number of serious questions in a very clumsy way. We've done a lot of work in politics with the tax office of how you can actually ask people information in a transparent, beautiful way for them to actually complete them. And it's such a shame to actually see retailers not actually, you know, really utilizing a great deal of knowledge as to how you can collect financial information in a way that's very, very successful. So we often see long forms, the the information about what the finance options may be not being quite there. And again, the shipping information being really, really complex. So that level of complexity, again, really, you know, raises an alarm to a consumer and actually go, I'm not going to go into that. And the third most important component is, is that, the, the aspect of price and basket and, you know, sort of the very reality of what, where you are and what you're actually doing is only appearing at the very end. So everyone is having an incredible journey. You are things, but the very cost of your actions and how much, you know, things may actually are, are, are added to be is not evident throughout the process. So there's that element of surprise at the very end. Oh, my God, my basket is so expensive. So we need to incorporate. Of course, it's not that we need a massive label every time that someone is actually choosing something, but a nudge to towards what's coming forward will actually prepare people to really simply accept what's happening. So if I had to summarize it, aesthetic value needs to match your your main body of of your site. The second, transparency and ease of information. There's so many wonderful tips as to how you can actually make it a lot easier. And the third, prepare people. Nobody likes a cold shower and especially a really expensive one. Um, Paul, uh, Russell, do, do you agree with that? Do you, is there anything new in nuggets of new information in there for you? Be interested to get your perspective on that. Um, no, I would, I would fully agree. I mean, I, I think um, you know you, you do see some checkouts which are very different to uh, you know to the sort of product pages, um, and um, I think. You know, with um, you know, with some of the more, more modern platforms, I, I think it, it does look more seamless. Um, and um, as I, said, I think the, the transparency it does. In my observation this year is that, that that does seem to be better now in terms of bringing forward some of the 
information um, around you know delivery costs and so forth. Um, so I, I, I can see that you know Dimitros' uh, insights I, I think are already being played through into the market, and I think you're beginning to see a lot of retailers taking that on board. Um, so which is which is good. It's um, yeah, and and we, we still have a long way to go. But um, but 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 I can see those those improvements coming through. I thought it was interesting, Demetrius. He's just saying, and, and I work funny enough one of our clients is that financial they work in the financial providers, and it's, it's it is a very personal thing, isn't it? When you talk about um, when you talk about when you have that discussion about your well, finances, how are you going to pay for this? You know, and I can only talk from this from past experience of actually running stores and stuff. When you come to that transaction thing and the live thing, it is all very especially being British is a discreet thing, isn't it? It's very uncouth to talk about finances and stuff like that, but you try and get that thing out of the way as quickly as possible. It's, it's quite an interesting point that actually, and, and I, you know, and I can sort of relate to that a little bit from a consumer point of view. It's like, oh, here we go. I've got to get my card out now. Do, do I want my details to be saved with this company? Ooh, I'm not sure. That's one thing I've done today is I've unclicked that button because I wasn't too sure. But, you know, it's a weird sort of psychological psychological thing that goes on in the head, isn't it? Really? It's like um, Absolutely. I think it's in psychology something that we, we sort of often call as the order effect. So it will be very, very different to actually ask you, where do you live? You know, let me calculate your shipping. So you know, before I must start asking you, what's your name? What's your card details? And so on. I'd like you to think that you know any any online transaction is almost very much like a dialogue, like a dialogue with someone that you might meet for the very first time. No dialogue starts with how much do you earn, give me your bank details, or what's your name. You know, you need something neutral, a more you know sort of you know more sort of you know gentle way to actually allow people to trust you. So, you know, starting very much with the shipping component, an easy way, you know, it will be a lot easier than simply just going for the hard stuff. And again, the order effect, you know, I, I, I would be a liar to actually say, this is the box standard order effect. Please, all of you follow that and you'll be incredible. Not at all. I think I'd like to, to support what Russell said with A-B testing. You know, it is quite interesting to actually within your client base to test what's the right order of all of these questions to appear within your site, within your client, base to truly understand what's the right order for them because it does depend upon the value of the of, of, of the goods uh, you know the, the typology of the the goods have been offered and so on but there are better ways than actually doing that again every online sort of interaction is a dialogue just think very carefully how would you actually engage with a client would you engage hardcore and actually scare them or would you find a more gentle subtle way to actually uh, get to the information without appearing creepy or violating their privacy mm. that's quite interesting now um, i'm gonna just i'm gonna ask a quick question the audience actually um for those out there listening if you if you if you can just drop in um the chat box what your sort of main reason for abandoning the cart you know for me i've, I've obviously given you my personal experience but if you if you can guys it'd be great for you to just pop in there and also if, as you put your uh, comment in the chat box if you can make it set it so that everyone could see it because that gives us a much better learning experience so yeah so if you've got any particular bugbears of why you abandoned your carts it'd be great to see what you guys think in the chat box um i'm gonna move on to my next question um and uh, yeah, you, yeah, before you, yeah there, there was there was one other insight that i think is worth yeah. going on with, with with so much online shopping moving on to mobile now i mean i think the majority is already um, uh, of, of, of fashion retail, sorry, of, of clothing retail shopping is already happening on mobile. Um, it, it, it's, you know, the speed with which we take customers through the checkout, I think is also important. So notwithstanding Dimitros's comments about that dialogue, I still think it needs to be a, it needs to be a fast, um, uninterrupted dialogue because, you know, with, with mobile devices, we, we, we mustn't forget that, they're, you know, the, the consumer is constantly being pinged with messages um, you know, whether that's, you know, WhatsApp messages or, um, you know, messenger messages or Snapchat or, or whatever, um, you know, if, if the consumer, you know, so if it's not a fast checkout process, there's a very good chance that the consumer could already get, can get dragged away to sort of answer a notification and get pulled, you know, into doing something else. So I think it's, it's just a new dimension um, that we don't see on, on traditional kind of desktop based, um, you know, PC based um, um, e-commerce 
Um, and so the speed with which we have that dialogue, as Dimitri said it, and, and, and the fluidity of that and the sort of naturalness, I suppose, of that is, is really key on mobile so that consumers kind of stay in the moment and finish it off before getting you know, pulled onto something else. Um, so I think that's just an important, um, so there's two, a bit like any dialogue, there's lots of distractions on a mobile device. I think it's even, it's even worse. Yeah. 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 And, uh, then my mum WhatsApps you as well. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I just read some of these comments actually. So it's quite interesting. So there's one here, not being able to continue as guest, uh, abandoned due to having to sign up when you just want to continue as guest. Uh, delivery either high costs or takes too long. That's the mm -hmm. same thing I was moaning about. Uh, too long, surprise delivery costs, delay in delivery, uh, make me create an account, hate it, exclamation mark. Uh, if alternative payment options aren't available as I don't always have my card, for example, Apple Pay, PayPal, Klarna. Any of these coming in a surprise to any of you? Um, no. <laughs> yeah, there's quite a few comments there, actually. It's quite a lot, actually. I won't read them all out, but if you guys, you, you can just click on the chat box and have a look. That's quite interesting. Um, uh, my next question was, uh, then the average cart abandonment is published at 70%. Uh, now, I'm sorry, I don't have the source for that. But I think it might come from your colleague, actually, Russell. But um, the question was, uh, does this seem about right in your experience? Paul, I want to bring you in on that. That's okay. Um, so I looked earlier, I went for a few of our clients' um, reports and it was closer to 60. Um, but I think our average client is a brand, like maybe a fashion brand. And I think um, uh, there's a little bit more kind of demand there um, because people are buying direct. I think there's probably less likelihood of um, abandoning. The only thing that I was going to say, and one of the variables that I don't think has been mentioned in the comments so far, is a couple of our clients um, who are quite big, or they're UK brands that, that do a lot of revenue through Europe. Um, I've seen the big increase off the back of the off the back of Brexit with the duties, and and I think um, one of Dimitri's comments was around kind of certain expectations. And I was going to say, I think one of the biggest things nowadays, there are like an increasing amount of variables with this kind of stuff. Um, and as you, uh, someone rightfully pointed out, the cutoff for Christmas delivery as well, I think comms is, is really important. Like for me, um, I'm a big advocate of what Russell was saying, which is just like get someone through the checkout as quickly as possible. Ideally push them through a digital wallet payment method. Um, yeah, just speed up the process as soon as possible. But the only, the only big thing that can impact some of that stuff is uh, where you've got variables like duties, like the yeah, cut up other things like that. Is you seeing duties a big, big thing now, Paul? With I think... Yes, yeah, so, so I think your next question is going to be around who's doing it right. So I'm kind of cutting on to the next question now. Um, one of my first points is Shopify. So I think Shopify's checkout, you know, it's super slick, very, you know, uh, seamless, like very little friction. Um, but one, uh, one of my only comments or one of my only faults with Shopify, uh, using their duties um, calculator, which is still in beta, um, but it basically just groups the duties costs with the shipping costs. Um, and it's a kind of shared line item and there's not any uh, room to communicate around what those, you know, how the duties works, everything else. So I think like that's, that's becoming a bigger thing. Like it looks horrendous. Like we've got one client where, um, the average order value is around a thousand pounds and the average duties cost is well in the hundreds. Um, and that their abandonment rate is so high for um, people shipping to certain territories. Um, and I think with that, you, you need to be able to communicate it properly and kind of explain it. Or, it, I mean, obviously at a higher level, it is a business decision as to how you handle duties and DDP and everything else. But um, I think that is a big thing in checkouts nowadays. Um, and the other thing is, even if you're not communicating that, actually um, you know if you are doing ddp you should really um be communicating that earlier in the process because people are looking to to you know if people are buying product from abroad they actually want to understand that and that's again friction which you should be looking to avoid um can you just on that point of who's doing it well are you able to name drop a few other sort of yeah names? so i'll say through my answer sorry i've skipped this out a little bit yeah, um, that's okay it's okay I, I think i'd still say shopify doing it well you know they're constantly optimizing their checkout i think any brand that's looking to kind of create a really good checkout experience should be looking at Shopify because second biggest checkout in the world. They've got over 2 million stores, no brainer. So I think they're doing really well. Um, but you do get the, um, 
you get some nuances where for international checkouts, like in my view, you should be trying to localize the field, localize language through the checkout. Sometimes you need to do a bit of work on that with Shopify. Um, you mentioned Pangaea earlier as one of Fetchify's clients. I think they've done quite a good job at like reducing the, they basically have an initial field for input new address, which is kind of like a postcode lookup, but you can input more information um, and then it expands and auto populates. That's like just another thing where they've kind of optimized it a little bit further and made it a bit more seamless. Um, and then the duties piece. And then I think uh, fast and bolt. Um, so kind of the really kind of slick, fast, you know, one-step payment solution or checkout solutions, they're getting much bigger. I think they're doing a really good job at providing a good experience. I used one of them the other day and it was a really positive experience. Um, in terms of retailers, so Nike and ASOS are often referenced as like just good checkout experiences. Um, Nordstrom I've listed just because I think they do a really nice job at comms with delivery methods. Um, so I think I think they're actually using Nava, but they essentially just provide really clear timing comms around when you'd get the item and it kind of differentiates the options really nicely and it actually kind of almost um, makes you want to pay um, for the kind of really express um, delivery option. Um, Burberry, I think, is very good for international. And this is one of the biggest points of friction that people don't necessarily see or realize. Um, so a lot of our clients are global brands and they're using platforms like Magento and Shopify and they don't have a global customer account. And what you'll find is there'll be a, you know, an edge, a certain level of edge cases where people are on the wrong store and they actually get all the way through to the checkout and then they can't ship because there's multiple warehouses or the stores are restricted. Um, and basically they're, shipping country isn't listed and Burberry do a really nice job of allowing you to so there's a little link that allows you to switch store it retains your basket and it keeps you logged in um, which I see as like the holy grail of like international kind of checkout experience and that is actually a lot more common than people think it is um, so that's an important one um, and then I think overall I've already said this but I think simplifying the checkout experience um, just trying to kind of make it as slick, clean as possible on mobile, allowing for guest checkout, um, allowing for as many express payment solutions as possible, getting them as early in the process as possible. Um, yeah, it's, it's best practice really. And like I say, certain expectations, comms around anything that's unlikely to be expected. I think that's the, um, yeah, what everyone should be looking to do. Cool. Um, the international thing is really interesting because, and funny enough, we did an inter we did a Brexit talk not long ago, and we did an internationalisation talk. And I think a lot of consumers they just, you know, especially within the fashion sphere, they just see a good product they like, they want to buy it, you know. And that journey becomes really difficult, you know, whether it's to do with duties or whether it's to do with checkout or any other sort of user experience thing. So that international thing is quite interesting. I did want to ask you, Paul, if the average abandon rate is seventy percent. What would you say that is when in terms of overseas sort of sales? Does that go up even higher than that? Then? Yes, true. It's a really good question. So I don't have an exact figure, but I think it depends because a lot of the time there'll be more, you know, there'll be more demand and, you know, there, there won't be as, uh, as many options for buying a product from, you know, there'll be a reason why they're buying it from an international brand and the intent will already be there. So I, I don't really know what that might look like, but there are a couple of other things I think that need to be considered around kind of localization. So again, if you're using one of the mainstream platforms, they don't typically localize the field names and the placeholder text within the checkout. And I don't think people will abandon because of it, but it's that same point around reducing friction mm -hmm. and trying to make that as, um, as optimal as possible. And then the other piece is things like the browser auto-completes and stuff like that. You quite often with international um, users you can have conflicts with the fields and that's another thing to avoid as well within the checkout for instance yeah I, I would absolutely, I'd absolutely second that Dale I think uh, it, you know the the, the 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 quickest win um as far as it ad address fields is, is is to take out browser autofill um, because it often conflicts with um yeah. conflicts with ad address validation and and the and, and the consumer is just ending up putting back in what can be bad information. And often the browser autofill doesn't, doesn't line up very well with, with, with the checkout form for that retailer. Um, you know, so I think the, 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 the quickest win would be turn off browser autofill um, 
uh, and 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 take you know take an address validation solution. Uh, I, I would say that of course, but um, we, but we do think but the browser auto fill really is a is a problem. It just sort of exacerbates um, problems by by putting in what can be bad information, um, but also putting it in into the wrong address field. So I absolutely agree with with Paul's, Paul's view on that one. And anecdotally, I've experienced that this morning as well. As well. It's putting in. It's put all my works details in the works card, and it's like, ah, uh, right, uh, how do I, oh, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, and on, on, on a mobile device, that's that's painful when you have to go back, and yeah, everything. I can imagine. Um, just want to remind the audience that at 3 p.m., we have a post uh, event networking session. Um, it's not quite as good as a real thing, but you're welcome to join myself and our panelists in uh, just a standard Zoom meeting. You can join us on screen if you like, or you can just sort of hide in the background, but that'd be an opportunity to ask further questions. Uh, if there's enough of us, we'll just break out into little uh, one-to-one rooms. So it's an opportunity for you to meet and talk to some of our, uh, our panelists and also maybe other audience members. So bear that in mind. Also, don't forget, if you have any questions, just raise your hand or pop them in the chat box and we will uh, get around to answering as many of them as possible. Um, I'd like to bring Demetrius back in at this stage. So we've talked a little bit about abandonment reports, um, but I wanted to sort of like marry up what you might get in an average abandonment report um, and what that means from a sort of like a psychological point of view and the psychology of bias. Are you able to sort of elaborate on what, you know, you might see in an average abandonment report, what that means from a psychological perspective? Um, if, if you want Russell to help in terms of what an average abandonment report might look like, I'm, I'm sure he'll contribute. But Yeah, I think that, that, that will help to allow some context mm -hmm. within that. Um, well, yeah, typically, um, if you looked on Google Analytics, um, you can imagine um, a kind of funnel going from the, you know, the sort of product page to the, the first stage of the checkout, which is typically put in your, your personal details. The second stage is to put in your delivery information and choose your delivery option. Um, and then the third stage is to put in your payment details. And, and, and if you can imagine there's a funnel where we would have, you know, you have a, um, different numbers of customers or sessions coming uh, through uh, at each stage of that checkout. And so your abandonment report would typically tell you, you know, what is the number of dropouts um, and what is the conversion rate between, between each stage. Um, so, so yeah, so it will tell you, you know, our, our, our consumers are typically more dropping out because of payments or, you know, or even before they, before they come from the product page, even into the checkout potentially. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. Mm, I, th I think of course, um, I'll be perfectly honest. So I haven't actually seen one of these reports and, you know, and I'm sure different companies will actually use a different report, but very much. I suppose they will be breaking down the process into chunks in terms of, you know, where individuals may be living in the process. What I could say is just that I, you know, there's, there's a number of, 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 there's a lot of work, a lot of research actually been done in terms of how people complete um, a form, how people actually engage, you know, the user experience with an online platform and so on. And the uh, one of the key techniques that we've learned, um, and again, this uh, one of the biggest case studies actually was the Bar uh, Barack Obama campaign in terms of actually getting people to donate money to his campaign. In the United States, a lot more common that you know, you know, common people like all of us will actually donate to a political party so they can win an election and so on. So they had two conditions or two ways of actually uh, reporting that there was one form that was actually asking you are um, you know, supporting a political party, give us your details, your payment details. And at the end, they actually ask him to make a promise, you know, promise us that you're going to stick with us and we're going to help us to uh, actually do this. Um, that sort of promise is sort of, you know, allowed people to sort of, you know, almost feel that they're making a promise, you know, this is actually quite nice. So if we can incorporate that level of promise somewhere prior to, to all of this, it will be important. Now, that sort of promise at some point, you know, when you go to say, for instance, to an online retailer that you're buying a t-shirt, you're not making a, t a promise to a brand that can be quite daft. I'm not paying a promise, but you know, something like, you now this is a checkout that will actually allow you to make the best deal. Let's, let's do this. So how can we engage them psychologically? The next component that was really, really interesting is that at times these forms actually are quite long. And of course they are long because you do need to collect, you know, the right forms. But what the Obama so, you know, campaigns actually done, they've actually broke it into two parts. So, you know, part one and part two. What happened was when, you know, the screen of the information was actually divided into two components, 
people were more likely to actually complete it rather than when the same information was actually on one page. Because the, the sense of you progressing was not there when you had to complete so much information in one continuous form. When you break it down into chunks, and again, some retailers may have to mark it into shipping, personal details, you know, sort of, you know, uh, delivery methods or whatever, you know, they feel is, is just, then, you know, they, again, as, as, as individuals, we actually feel that we are completing something, we you know, one, two, three, and we will be uh, more willing to actually continue with the process. At times, the process is so tedious, it's badly designed, it's small little boxes, especially if you're using your phone, it's really, really bad to actually type in things. So if we can break this sort of process into chunks that will allow people to feel a sense of achievement by completing, okay, done, I have only three steps and the product is mine, it's going to be a lot easier. I think, and I, I'll agree with both, you know, you know, with both gentlemen before, with both Paul and Russell in terms of, you know, make it easy, make it quick, make it fast, but also make it in a way that it's easy to use and easy for someone to actually feel a sensation of, you know, achievement. I've done this, I've completed this step, let's move on to the next one and the product is mine. Rather than having a really long ongoing process that's just very tiring, very boring, and most people will actually stop halfway through and go, well, I'll do it another time, I'll come back into it, and they actually they never come back into it. So break it down, break it down in the same way that you'll break down a task for, for, for a really, really young individual. That's interesting. That's very interesting. Um, I wanted to also ask Demetrius as well, like, is there anything we can learn um, from the real life checkout journey that, you know, online businesses? Because, I mean, you spoke, we spoke a bit earlier about fashion having a very high uh, checkout rate. And we also find that, obviously, that, theories between gender as well because women tend to buy differently to men you know tend to buy a huge amount of clothing you know try it on and buy two items with guys often not you know hugely generalizing here so forgive me out in the audience but there is some st stats to back this up um guys tend to you know there's a, they vary to actually not trying on stuff but is there anything we can learn from real life checkout journey mm. that you know the online guys can learn? yeah i don't think that i mean there are gender differences mm -hmm. but they're not as massive as we think they are and i think again we're moving towards a more equal way of between the two genders how they actually are. from our own research what we've actually seen is and i've done a great deal of work with a number of how could i put it um, search engines companies and we actually sort of you know see that you know the difference between how we shop and how we engage with different uh, online platforms it depends upon timing, timing of when in our own day we actually do it and how we can customize the information that we might be receiving. So the way that you shop in terms of your patience, your time, where you are during you know, working hours versus in the evening changes completely. So you are a very different shopper. You have exactly the same values. You have exactly the same requirements as to who you are and what you're looking for. But your patience changes, your focus changes, your attention is changing, and your level of fatigue is changing. So, of course, we know that individuals actually want a description where the product is, for instance, or a description, or, you know, how we actually do it. But the more fatigued that you might be, the less likely you have to pay attention to all of these things. So you might be actually, you know what, I can't read the fine print. I'm not going to get engaged with this. Off you go. So I think it would be really, really important for actually to, to try and understand, you know, the, the very timing of where these processes or these purchases have been made and adjust it accordingly to actually understand where the market is. Obviously, this is a lot easier to be done with a market that, you know, that you're very popular in the UK, you're this in the UK, so you pretty much can regulate it. It's a lot more challenging to customize that sort of journey, that consumer journey, when you have a global brand and then you really have to look into that. But I think the technology is there to provide a process to actually detect certain things. I think we all treat consumers being stable. We're not stable people. We do change. And one thing that we know for sure is timing and where we are in you know, during our day changes our, you know, how we pay attention to things, how patient we are. And that level of patience can actually make or break a purchase journey just because the more time we are, the more likely we want the information to be presented in a more easy, accessible manner to make the purchase. So we're less alert. So we actually want something to echo that as such. And... Um, 
some there are people that have already woke up to this and uh, they're designing sort of time related purchasing sort of you know platforms you know okay. you, you you think and uh, then others but i really i just want to 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 advise people to actually not to think humans as machines we're not robots we actually change we have you know different modes of, of active of behaving of deciding so just think of what your consumer what time do they normally those check-ins actually come and 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 probably work with an individual like russell or paul to actually really get as much data about that particular journey as to where people are coming from and customize that according to the data data is key you can't you know you can go against data and science but use that to actually understand the human being for who they are rather than just assume that they're identical across their day. Nobody's the same across their day. Thank you. Thank you. Just, um, uh, did anyone want to come back on that at all? Or if not, I'll move on to my next question, um, which is uh, to Paul. Um, Paul, I'd like to just bring you in on this stage. I want to go back to sort of like talking about APIs. You did touch on it a little bit earlier, but can you just tell us uh, what sorts of APIs and plugins are, are worth having uh, you know, to improve your checkout process? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think it does vary dependent on your technology stack, um, but I've written down a few here. So I think um, I mentioned Narbar earlier, um, which within the checkout piece is, is really good at kind of setting um, essentially uh, time scales or certain expectations around the timing of delivery against each shipping option. And that would integrate with your carriers and basically provide um, accurate, clear, um, estimated delivery time scales. Um, and then Aftership and Melomo are two other companies that are kind of moving into that area, um, maybe at the slightly lower end. Um, but I think that as a principle is good and they're just free providers that can support that. Um, Fetchify um, from an address validation postcode lookup perspective. Um, payment options I've talked about a lot, but I think also, um, you know, I've talked about, you know, the Apple Pays, the Google Pays, the PayPal's, the Klarna's, et cetera. But then I think from an international perspective as well, um, you know, some of the payment options that you need from a Middle East perspective, Asian perspective, you know, um, Ideal, so forth, Gyro Pay, et cetera, in Europe. Um, all of that's really important. Um, I think that the, so I have put in kind of some of the newer ways to kind of build an authenticate account, but I don't think that's critical personally. Um, I think, you know, when you're a bigger retailer and you know you've got a massive reliance on loyalty and repeat purchase or, you know, high, high volume then maybe. But um, for me, I think guest checkout is, is the best practice. Um, Noibu, I've already mentioned, but I think actually bug identification, that can save you, that can make you so much money. And I think, um, Essentially, it's like a level of automated testing. Um, and then it's just a little bit more sophisticated than the kind of standard scripts that people run. So uh, that I think is really good. Um, feedback, I said this isn't really the checkout process, but I think the order confirmation page is like hugely underutilized. So, you know, uh, rule-based feedback is something we've started to do with a lot of our clients, but I think you can do a lot with the order confirmation page. Even like, I always talk about stripping down the checkout process, making it more seamless, but. We've also had clients that have um, requested additional information on the uh, order confirmation page and got a really good completion rate. Um, yeah, and I think I think they're kind of some of the main ones, to be honest. Paul, what do you is that if you got that written down in digital form? <laughs> I was, was going to ask if, if it's easy to share yeah. in the chat box. That'd be brilliant. To, to, yeah. you've, you've obviously mentioned um, was it Fetchify and Carla and stuff. That'd be great. If not, if you can, you can email it to us, and we can. I'll email it to you. you can send it yeah, right yeah, okay. If you email to you, what we'll do there, yeah. we'll, we'll put that as a published post on our LinkedIn page. Uh, so, if, and we'll, we can, if we've got time, we can include it in the follow up email to delegates as well. That might be useful. And one more I would add quickly, dependent on your circumstances, the Ganga and that's that duties piece. Like from a kind of customer experience perspective, um, a duties calculator, I would say, is good practice if you if there's a good chance that your customer is going to end up getting an invoice for for import duties. I think that's ideal. You want to avoid it, but yeah, I think that's that's kind of good practice. Mm -hmm. cool. Paul, is there is there one is there a tool that you would recommend for um, you know for sort of upsell and and sort of selling related products? Um, you know. In, yeah. Or, or, or are most of those native to... Um... Yeah, that's a really good question. So I would say it depends uh, whether you're talking about... So typically, we would do a lot of um, very considered, carefully positioned upselling within the cart. So be that a push cart or the actual cart page. 
I think that can add a huge amount of value. So Joseph Joseph's a really nice example. Um, loads of our clients um, do that. Um, we've then got some clients, so some of our Shopify clients use a solution called Rebuy, um, which allows you to do subscription upsell. So essentially, if you've got a single item in the basket and you want to upsell them to subscribe, if that's applicable, um, they also do in checkout upsells, which I'm not a huge fan of. Like I said, I like to simplify everything, like really clean experience, but it does work. So uh, Fairfax and Favor have it. Um, and I think there's, I can't remember what it is, it's an accessory. Um, we've got another client that does it with gift box and that can actually increase basket size a lot. Um, and then the other big trend at the moment is post-purchase uh, product recommendation. So again, on the order confirmation page, um, people essentially um, having a window, so say it's 10 minutes before the order is downloaded to your, uh, whichever systems you're using. Um, or passed over to your free PR or whatever else, um, where you can still add additional items to the basket. And that's got a really, really good success rate. And yes, I've spoke to so many brands are making a lot of money from that, um, particularly if there's like a promotion associated. So yeah, I think recommendations, again, really good point. Um, I'd be careful with in checkout recommendations, just because again, you've still at risk with more friction, but um, either side, I think really valuable. The, the reason I ask is that when we, we've surveyed our customers and well, and other customers recently, um, and, you know, uh, uh, apart from, um, well, the, the, one of the biggest, one of the biggest uh, APIs and tools that's used is that, that, that kind of upsell and, um, you know, uh, cross sell uh, options in, in, you know, around the checkout. You're, you're right. Maybe not in the checkout, but around the checkout. Um, so. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, right. We're coming to the sort of like, the last stretch now so i've got my last final questions uh i want to ask you guys um uh, at this stage i just want to remind everybody in the audience that we do have a, like a post networking session immediately after this at 3 p.m the link is there in the chat box uh, you can join us on screen with us if you like if you if, or you can just join us uh with audio but um we'd be uh, delighted if you can join us all uh, for that afterwards. I just want to also thank um, Russell and his team at Fetchify again for sponsoring uh, today's session. If um, my colleague Scarlett can drop their details in the chat box as well, that'd be great. Um, and I've got a couple of last questions uh, for you guys. And I just want to come to you, Russell. Just I want to just clarify, uh, is there anything we've missed out in today's discussion? That is there any other factors that, uh, that we haven't mentioned that can decrease conversion rate at the checkout stage, do you think, or have we pretty much covered everything off? I think we've covered. I think we've covered the main things. I, I think there are some tactical things. Um, so, for example, uh, I think Paul sort of alluded to it. Um, but you know, as a result of um, Brexit, we have seen some. You know, some retailers not able to ship to parts of the UK. You know, like Northern Ireland and so forth. Um, or, or that's very much kind of come to the fore. And so, this idea of having regional exclusions within your um, within your sort of shipping options and within your, within your address options, that seems to be um, a bit of a barrier um, uh, unless the retailer is sort of working through that carefully um, and, and sort of maybe flagging it earlier in the in the process. Um, uh, I, I loved Dimitros' uh, insight about the um, about uh, you know fatigue and sort of time of day. I, I hadn't. Um, it's absolutely from a personal perspective. I can absolutely relate to that. Mm. I guess I've never I've never seen it cited in, um, but but I think it's absolutely relevant. You know that um, we do have to bear in mind that some some consumers are are, are doing particularly <laughs> particularly. Uh, I'm in the final throes of Christmas shopping for my kids and and doing a lot of it at sort of very very late at night. So I can I can absolutely uh, testify to the fatigue factor. So um, so. So yeah, the simpler and and the easier the checkouts, the, the better, as far as I'm concerned. It's fascinating, isn't it? Because I'm exactly the same as you, Russell. I, you know, I can relate to that on a personal note, but I've never seen it cited from, from a professional point of view that you need to account for this and people would actually develop technology to account for that sort of thing. It's yeah. really fascinating. I appreciate it, Dimitris. Is there anything from either Paul or Dimitris do you think we've missed? I think um, payments, uh, this is quite a big topic, but I still, I think there's often dependent on how much work you do on this and how much, how proactive your finance team are, but quite often there's an opportunity around um, things like fraud rules and general kind of acceptance rates with payment providers. Um, like quite often you'll find that um, 
some of the fraud kind of uh, thresholds and rules in place are quite aggressive um, and there'll quite often be an opportunity to recover revenue there. Like companies like Signified, you know, claim to be able to add a huge amount of um, additional income through um, kind of more sophisticated fraud analysis. But I think there's usually an opportunity there for an internal team. Um, and the other one I would say, particularly if you're on like a bespoke platform or Magento or, you know, SAP or one of these types of more technical platforms where things like releases are a lot more complex and there's a lot more risk um, from a kind of development perspective, I would say bugs is a big one, like realistically, um, regard, like it might be a smaller bug, it might be a bigger bug, but um, be it having a control on that and being able to monitor and quantify, I think is really important. Um, and then I think that's, they're kind of the main ones. Really. The only other one I've commented on a little bit is error messaging like you'll often see retailers with uh, that have pretty serious errors through the um, checkout process but they don't necessarily communicate what the error actually is or how you can get around it um, and then the other one which we've talked about anyway is shipping just lack of clarity on timing and, and you know very expensive shipping. Uh, Demetrius anything you think we've yeah. missed out? No, nothing. I think I, I, I've learned a great deal from both Russell and Paul today about a number of things that I had no idea. It's just beautiful to, to put names and the technical components are really, really enriching. But I think for me, like for anyone who may be starting now and for anyone who's actually trying to develop the, the experience of their business or their clients, I mean, we, we have developed a model which we call ETA, and it's just simply a matter of you know, helping you know, sort of retailers and, and any, any form of platform to, to enhance the user experience. And it's, you know, E stands for ease, make it easy, make it accessible and make it you know, easy for someone to actually use that 11-year-old. And that's the boxing standard of cognitive ability. Don't treat clients as an adult because they are coming in different, I mean, different mental and cognitive abilities of understanding language and lingo. If the test can be passed, if someone can actually complete the form by 11 years old, you've succeeded. Don't trust anyone above 12, 11. I'm not saying people are not smart enough, they are, but we all have very different cognitive abilities to understand language. Say for instance, an electricity bill can only be understood by 14% of a nation because mm -hmm. this is how technical is. So keep it easy, keep it accessible. T stands for transparency. We in an era where things you know, are quite challenging in terms of fees, taxing, um, you know, sort of, you know, Brexit, all of that malarkey, which unavoidably we have to deal with it, but actually keep it transparent, allow people to actually see what is actually coming. When people are in the know, they won't be disappointed, they continue with you. And A stands for aesthetics. Make it look as appealing as your main site. Don't force them into the back room. Actually look at your aesthetics, look at the environment, look at everything that's around that payment process and break it down and actually make it comfortable. The same amount of energy and creativity that you put onto your main page where you feature your product, it should be exactly the same at the very end. It's a process, it's a journey. Don't actually disjoint it, make it smooth. So ease, ease transparency and aesthetics and you're on a winner. Thank you, Demetrius. Um, Russell, you were nodding and smiling with that. Is there anything you'd like to add to that? And if not, can you give us your passing thoughts and tips on how um, some of our audience can you know, improve their retail experience? I don't know. I, I'm not sure I can sum it up any any <laughs> uh, Demetrius just did. Um, so, um, yeah, no, I, I mean, I think... I think ETA and, and those aspects of ease and, and transparency and aesthetics are absolutely borne out in the research or the sort of typical um, reasons that, 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 that consumers give for, uh, for abandoning carts. Um, but, you know, I think it's, it's important to also do your homework, you know, um, get into your analytics, um, work out for yourself where your consumers are, you know, are dropping out and, um, you know, and, 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 and look at the numbers and, and, uh, and, and do it that way. So you know, get get the um, the fact based uh, decisions to how to improve your 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 checkout, and then and then make incremental changes. You know, A B test them because it's so crucial. Um, I, I, I absolutely uh, think uh, you know uh, it's so crucial not 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 to big make big sweeping changes without without testing the, the, how that can affect your your checkout. Um, Paul, any parting comments? Do you want to just sum up uh, your tips about improve flow through? Yeah, I think my um, my points have all been pretty similar, and I think just keep it simple, particularly on mobile. Faster you can get someone through the checkout as possible via the most localized messaging. Um, I think is best practice. Thank you, gentlemen. We've finished almost on time. 
if not 30 seconds before time. So I'll just sum up and just say thank you all for, um, for, for sharing your insights. I found this generally really interesting today. Uh, it's just having everyone from three different sort of perspectives is what I found interesting. Um, I look forward to sort of like having a quick chit chat with you after this in the uh, breakout session. And just to remind our audience, if you want to join us, you're more than welcome. Just click on that link there and we'd be delighted if you can join us on screen. But if not, you can just um, join us in the background and you can ask questions. If there's enough of us, we'll break out into little one-to-one sort of mini networking things. It only takes about 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes tops. So anyway, without further ado, chaps, I want to just uh, thank you again for really enjoyed uh, listening to you guys share your insights today. And thank you very much. I'll see you shortly. Thank you. Thank you.